Sisters and brothers, attend to this wisdom. It is a reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, beginning in the sixth chapter. Jesus came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astounded and they said, where did this man get all of this? What is this wisdom that, he has, that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their own hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deeds of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you, and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, between what is spoken and what is heard, let there be truth. Some weeks back, I preached on Jesus' first homecoming in the third chapter of the Gospel of Mark, and like today's story, that first homecoming was, well, disappointing. One could not help but hear There in that first reunion, the resonances of John, he came to his own, and his own did not know him. It begs a question of us, doesn't it? When Jesus returns, will we know him? Will we recognize him for what he is? Or, like his family, will we wonder about the legitimacy of someone who seems so familiar to us, but who we believe might be punching above their weight? Or asked another way, will the Messiah have have, we have imagined, the Messiah we are desperate to meet, the Messiah we are so convinced we know, impede us from ultimately accepting the Messiah that is, even if that one is quite close to us? I suppose this week's lesson is about rejection. Who is doing the rejecting? What is the Lord's response to it? And what should be ours? In Mark 3, the rejection is quite active in that we are told that when his family heard it, all the fuss that was caused by Jesus' teaching and healings, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying he has lost his mind. Remember that this is right after Jesus has appointed the twelve. And he is once again engaged with the scribes from Jerusalem, which is to say, those who ought to have known better. The Lord's response to his family's rejection of him in that first reunion is effectively to disown them. Who are my mothers and my brothers, he asks. And looking at those who sat around them, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. That's pretty powerful stuff. It points at a radical restructuring of the way family works in the inbreaking reign of God. But why, after such a disappointing family reunion on the first pass, does Jesus return for one more? Maybe he's not quite ready to give up on Mama Maria and his siblings. After all, they surely will have heard now about all the awesome deeds of power that he's been performing all over the countryside. He commands the wind and the rain on the Sea of Galilee. The weather recognizes his authority, for goodness sakes. He casts out demons on the other side of the Gennesaret, who immediately upon simply looking at him cry out, What have you to do with me, 
Jesus, Son of the Most High God. One can imagine that even as he is walking up the road, passing the welcome to Nazareth sign, he is thinking in his head, if even the weather and the demons of hell recognize and obey me, surely the folks who saw me growing up will. But instead, isn't that the carpenter's kid? Isn't that Mary's son? A question which many who study scripture think is a sort of a backhand calling into question whether or not Joseph was really Jesus' dad. Where did he get all this? Who does he think that he is? What is it, do you think, about familiarity that breeds contempt? Why is it so hard to see and accept God making all things new in someone we know? Today's gospel continues with the writer describing the fact that so deep was the incredulity and unbelief of the hometown crowd that they took offense at him, which is to say they were scandalized by him, which is also to say they stumbled over him. In that particular way of describing their reaction will be important for them and for us because it will be ringing in our ears when they see Jesus for what he truly is at the end of this gospel and every other one after it. When the hometown kid is taken into custody in Gethsemane, four chapters from here, when he is beaten and brutalized and rejected by everyone, even the twelve who themselves perform deeds of power in his name, When the simple carpenter's son from Nazareth, this time not in his hometown, but in Jerusalem, this time not as Jesus, the son of Mary, hometown kid turned big shot, but rather Jesus, the king of the Jews and the son of the living God. When the building block that was rejected by his own family, by his own people, by the whole of the world and ultimately even by us whom he was saving, even as we rejected him becomes the chief cornerstone of a heavenly family into which all of creation is being redeemed, well, then there will be no doubt in our minds who this Jesus is and by what authority he does the things he does. And we will all wonder then, how come we didn't see it? How could we have missed it? Crestfallen and rejected in today's gospel, the Lord's response is not what we expect. It's not the slinking off in defeat and depression or the riling and cursing at uh, his contemporaries. If we are honest, we might have characterized these kind of responses as ones we would have had in a similar situation. Jesus instead is renewed in his salvific mission. The 12 he called and appointed three chapters ago at the first disastrous hometown return, he now commissions them and sends them out. He imputes in them the same power by which he has been exercising and healing and liberating. He admonishes them to go out in faith, to seek hospitality, and to preach the good news of forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. And that would have been sufficient, I think, don't you? But the gospel leaves us with this kicker, If any place will not welcome you, and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake even the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. We can surely understand how Jesus might have been frustrated, even fed up by those who had ears but still refused to hear. But shake the dust from your feet? That doesn't sound to me like the making of all things new. That does not sound like the final position of the God who in Jesus is redeeming all in all. People of God, you will inevitably be frustrated by those who simply will not come out of their prison cells and into the light of the living God who has freed them even with the door wide open. Sure, shake some dust off your boots, but know that God is capable of redeeming everything. And that your message, the good news that you have been entrusted with, whether it is accepted or not, is ultimately that Jesus, in God, 
has already done it. Amen.